Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I'll read verses 24 through 28. Now those who were sent from the Pharisees, they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This text has an amazing contrast between the glory of Christ and the humility of man. This comparison is intentional. There's something very important that God wants us to understand. When we compare the greatest person who lived, John the Baptist, with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you and I take the very best part of our lives, the best of us, all the good deeds we've done. You listening? All the moral values. All the nice aspects of our personality. All the unselfishness, the sacrifice, the good work ethic, providing for our loved ones, all those positive traits of your life and character. Put them all together. And our text indicates they are infinitely inferior to the Lord Jesus Christ who is God himself, who is perfect in every way. So here's my question. Since we all tend to have an elevated opinion of ourselves and crave attention and desire recognition and thanks and have a relentless battle with pride, self-centeredness, egotism, conceit, self-absorption, and narcissism, how can we stay he uh, humble, emptied of self, and keep Christ on the throne of our minds and hearts and give Him the glory in all things? How can we do that? Well, this text supplies somewhat of an answer. And God willing, I'll answer that question in today's message titled, Christ's Glory and John's Humility. You have your outline in your bulletin. You can follow along with that. And indeed, those two things, Christ's glory and John's humility, are contrasted, as I said, in our text. As we shall see and continue our study today, verse by verse, in the Gospel of John. Now, there are three main truths that emerge from this text, verses 24 through 28 of John chapter 1. First, religious bankruptcy, verse 26. Second, divine preeminence, verse 27a. And thirdly, man's humility, verse 27b. Now you'll remember, after the introduction in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, called the prologue, the rest of John, verse 19, the through the end of the chapter, verse 51, is devoted to bringing out an early testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of John's gospel begins with a testimony to Christ after the prologue that ends in verse 18, beginning with verse 19, through the end of the chapter, there is this powerful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ given by the forerunner, John the Baptist. This is a very important person in the Bible. Not because of who he, he is in and of himself, but because of his unique place that God has for him in the plan of salvation by bringing in and preparing the way of the Messiah. Now, John the Baptist, in verses 19 through 39 has a powerful witness to Jesus Christ given in three ways. First, a witness given to 
this committee, this deputation of the Pharisees sent to John from Jerusalem. We see that witness to this committee of the Pharisees in verses 19 through 28. We already looked at part of that witness to the Pharisees in verses 19 through 23, and today we'll pick it up at verse 24 through 28. But we continue that powerful witness of John the Baptist to these Pharisees in today's message. And then the second witness of John the Baptist to Christ is to the people. The people that are there in the surrounding area where John is as he is baptizing many of them. In verses 29 through 34. And then his third witness, John's third witness, is to these two disciples of his the disciples of John the Baptist, in verses 35 through 39, which we'll get to, God willing, in, uh, in a couple of messages from now. So we see John's witness in verses 19 through 39 to the Pharisees, to the people surrounding John, and then lastly to two disciples. So let's consider then with that introduction our first point. Number one, religious bankruptcy. Look at verses 24 and 25. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? The Pharisees were the strictest sect of the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem who prided themselves on their superior knowledge of the Old Testament and the law. And in their efforts to obey the minute details and instructions of the Old Testament, they considered themselves the most zealous and diligent among all the leaders, including the Pharisees, in obeying every jot and tittle of the law. But most of them, listen, most of them represent a large body of people in the church today. If we would make a comparison and an application between the nation of Israel and their leaders with the church today and some of our leaders in the church. Most of the vast majority of the Jews and the leadership were hypocrites who appeared religious but who lived very sinful lives behind the scenes. And we read about this in Romans chapter 2, if you'll turn there to Romans chapter 2, mm -hmm. by way of brief application. We're told that if we would honor God and worship God and serve God in a way that pleases Him, we cannot have this disparity and this dualism between profession and possession. We must practice what we preach. We must not only be hearers of the word, we must be doers. Anyone who professes to God, I know you, I am your child, I love you, God immediately goes beneath the surface of that person's mind and life and compares their profession of faith in Christ with them actually serving Him and knowing Him and obeying Him. And we see this disparity explained by Paul in the book of Romans chapter 2. And he explains a huge mystery in the Old Testament. When you read the Old Testament, you see the Jews constantly falling into the trap of hypocrisy. And the result is that God brings down chastisement and judgment in small or in large forms. He cannot leave an individual or a body or even an institution that professes to know God and represent God in the world and serve God and worship God. He cannot leave them alone if they profess to be the representatives of God in sound doctrine and in true worship in spirit and in truth if they are living a double life, whether it be on a national or an institutional level in the Old Testament 
or an institutional level in the New Testament, or an individual level in both covenants. And so, the, and through the Apostle Paul, Paul knew this. He knew about this double-mindedness and this twofold lifestyle which is incompatible with the new birth and true Christianity. He knew about this and he wrote about it through inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Romans 2 verse 28. Follow along in your Bible. If you have a Bible, turn there please. If you don't, use your cell Bible, your cell phone Bible. And I want you to see this. Romans 2.28 for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And this is where John the Baptist is headed in verses 24, 25, and 26. He's going to point out the huge, undeniable, brazen hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders as well as the people of Israel in general. And later on in the scripture, in the, in the Gospels, John the Baptist, we read, calls these leaders and the people to repentance. He says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Bring forth the fruits worthy of your profession of faith. If you don't have the fruits, you are not saved. Because every child of God who is regenerated by the Spirit of God will always bring forth a changed heart and a changed life and the fruits thereof. Turn a few chapters over to Romans 9. Yeah. Romans 9. Again, this is repeated, this idea of dualism. Romans 9, verse 6. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. That is the physical seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is in the promise of spiritual life and new birth through faith. That is, verse 8, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted as the seed. That is the promise that God gave to Abraham. That if Abraham believes God, that faith in Christ, as it were, would be counted to him for righteousness. And so, true salvation has nothing to do with the outward person. Those who are the children of God are not the children of the flesh, whether it be a, a, a blue-blooded Jew of the Old Testament. These are not the children of God. Whether you were brought up in a church in America or anywhere else, mm. but the children of God are children of the promise, that is, of faith. Faith that leads to the new birth and the new birth always leads, leads to its intended consequences, which are fruits and powerful life-changing evidences of conversion. The Pharisees wanted to know what authority John had for baptizing. If he wasn't one of the most important persons they named, they said, John, you, well, you're not Christ. You're not Elijah. You told us you're not the prophet. Then who are you? John answered them in verse 26a. Saying, I baptize with water. Now let's stop there for a moment. John didn't want anyone to think that he was important. He didn't want the spotlight on himself. Because in the next statement... He's going to shift the entire conversation over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So this phrase, I baptize with water, is a transitional phrase. It's not an end unto itself. He's referring to himself in answer to the Pharisees' questions, who are you? Oh, I baptize with water. I'm just this guy here who's baptizing with water. And he only gives us four, there's only four words there, or three. Mm -hmm. 
if you want to look at the original. He uses three words to describe himself. And we should always do that ourselves. Use the smallest amount of vocabulary. Use the highest economy of words when we talk about ourselves. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, let us preach volumes. Let us quote much scripture. And let us do so being animated and motivated by the Spirit of God. Force our hearers to shut us up somehow, some way. Because we won't stop talking about Christ and His love. And what He's done in our lives by changing us and creating within us a new heart and giving to us a new nature that we might know Him, that we might be saved and forgiven, and that we might enjoy the unspeakable privilege of being His servant and, saved and serving Him for all of our lives and reflecting His gospel as lights shining in the darkness, both in word and in deed and lifestyle. So John didn't want the spotlight on himself. His purpose was simply to prepare people for Christ. And that's our purpose. Mm -hmm. To redirect the conversation to Christ when we're sharing the gospel. Yes, there's a place for personal testimony, but only as a servant and a prop to direct people to Jesus Christ. We have to be careful when we share testimonies that we don't go on and on and on about ourselves and our credentials and our resume and I did this. And by, by the time we're done, we have two seconds left to share the gospel with them because we just got done talking an hour about ourselves. The Holy Spirit works through the word of God and the teaching and preaching of the gospel. The Apostle Paul says we preach him. He told Timothy in the pastoral epistles, Preach Christ. He told him that over and over and over again. And so, whenever one of his hearers, that is John's hearers, repented of their sins, as he says, I baptize with water, he baptized them in water, but he did so, the water being an outward symbol of an inward change. You say, well, that's an easy one, Pastor Joe. That's an ABC of Christianity. Oh, really? You would be surprised how many people put emphasis on the physical elements and symbols of the Christian faith, including baptism, the Lord's Supper, and the external observances of Christian activities. Because when you become spiritually and temporarily bankrupt of spiritual life, there is this legalistic tendency in us to shift mm -hmm. to the outer symbols of the faith, to the outer external elements and activities of the faith. And then if we don't re repent, our superficial mental and spiritual momentum will lead us to a place where we begin to rationalize and say, well, I went to church on Sunday. I must be doing pretty good. I gave God his due in this thing, that thing, and the other thing. I gave my dollar in the offering box, or whatever you give. <laughs> There's such a mysterious yet powerful and subtle shift that when our hearts are, have been emptied of the life and the power and the keen discernment of the Holy Spirit concerning our moment-by-moment moment spiritual condition, we of necessity and legalistically shift to outward things to provide temporary justification, satisfaction, and the salving of our hearts in our blindness. And that's why one of the wise reasons God ordained the means of grace, the Word of God, preaching, teaching, Bible study, meditation on the Word, and fellowship, mm -hmm. is to have the Word of God pierce again the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow as a discerner of our hearts to reveal our spirit 
spiritual misery and pitiful condition having wandered from the Lord temporarily. And that's why I'm afraid for a believer or even a member that doesn't attend church for three, four, five weeks at a time, even if the reasons are legitimate. There is something about the absence of the Word of God. And sure, they can make up for it in different ways. I would assume that they would still be reading if they're sick for long periods of time at home. But as many avenues of the Word of God that we can bring in, whether it be personal Bible study, devotions, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, fellowship with spiritually minded believers who have the Word of God in their thoughts, who, as the Scripture says, God is in all their thoughts, will be able spontaneously at the moment be able to share with me unafraid of their conscience convicting them. Those are the kinds of sources that I need to keep me. I need to take advantage of every resource possible to bring the Word of God into my life. And then I need the blessing of the Holy Spirit to apply it. Because the Pharisees were experts at living on the surface, bringing the Word of God in, but not penetrating to the heart and the spirit and change them and bring about repentance In other words, in our text, the Pharisees were saying to John, if you're not the Christ, the prophet, or Elijah, why are you baptizing these people? Mm -hmm. They're implying that he has no right to <laughs> baptize them. Of course, they didn't connect the prophecy of John being the forerunner mm -hmm. of the Lord Jesus Christ because they did not know the signs of the times. They did not know that many of the prophecies applied to Jesus Christ. And Jesus rebuked them for that. Jesus said to them, you, you can discern the weather, whether it's going to be sunny or cold or rainy, that night or tomorrow. How is it that you cannot discern the signs of the times? And so the Pharisees were hugely ignorant mm -hmm. about Christ and about Christ's servant, the forerunner, John the Baptist, preparing the way for Christ. And so they didn't connect John's baptism with part of his ministry in preparing the way and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So coupled with this question that the Pharisees asked him, if you're not the Christ, who are you? Is something that the Jewish uh, people and the Pharisees had a practice of and that practice was that only Gentile proselytes were baptized in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the decades, maybe a few centuries leading up to the ministry of John the Baptist and thereafter, the Jews only baptized Gentile proselytes. They didn't baptize Jewish people. And so here's John baptizing Jewish people who are repenting. And they're wondering what's going on. And John told them, the reason I'm baptizing them is preparing for the Messiah who is about to come on the scene. He's the Lord, and I'm preparing people's hearts for him. Jewish, Gentile, it doesn't matter. I'm preparing everyone's heart for Christ. Continuing, verse 26b, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. Notice the bankruptcy of the Pharisees. Now, why do we say religious bankruptcy? Because this statement reveals the spiritual emptiness, the moral blindness, and the spiritual illiteracy of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are depicted as groping around in darkness. They can't figure out who John is. The Pharisees can't connect the prophecies of the forerunner with anything in the Old Testament. They do not see... Jesus as being connected with any of the prophecies, though there were over 300 prophecies mm 
in the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, the 39 books of the Old Testament, about the Messiah, where he will be born, how he will die, how he will live his life, how he will be born of a virgin. None of them connected one of those prophecies to Jesus Christ. Talk about a level of ignorance. I was the same way as a Jew being brought up in Brooklyn in the synagogue, going through six years of Hebrew school, learning how to read and write Hebrew, learning many of the most frequently used nouns and verbs in Hebrew, being able to stand before a congregation and read it so fluently. And, but I had no clue about the Old Testament messianic prophecies pointing to Jesus Christ. When I heard the gospel for the first time at 18 years old at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, you talk about a shock when I learned that Jesus was the Messiah. He had already come 2,000 years before. And he fulfilled all of these prophecies to the letter. The first thing that came to my mind was, why didn't somebody tell me about this? And of course the answer is spiritual blindness on the part of the Jews. All the Jews except the remnant chosen by grace, that, that root of the trees where we read in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah says the axe is laid to the root of the trees. And so the, the picture is that the tree falls down, it's cut off the root, and only the stump remains. And the stump are the minority, the 10% or less, of Jews who will become born again, like myself. And therefore we look at the world today and over the last 2,000 years in particular, and we find that the vast majority of the Jewish people are lost. And then when we read passages like this, and the Pharisees are completely ignorant about the Messiah. They could not recognize the signs of the times in which he came. They could not connect Jesus with any of the prophecies. They would not. And so we see this huge illiteracy. And the Pharisees were proud about being the caretakers of the oracles of God, the Old Testament. And they spend so much time reading the scriptures reading the scriptures, and they would take a scroll in the temple, many of them, the Pharisees, and they would read in certain places, and they would daven and with their prayer body language, and they would read the scripture as an act of reading and prayer together. But the word did not penetrate their hearts. It did not provide spiritual understanding. It did not bring them to a place of conversion and find true peace with Jehovah Elohim, the God of their fathers. But look at us. Look at us. Most of us in this room and listening to this message on the internet are not native Jews. You were not brought up as, as a Jew in Brooklyn like me, which doesn't matter. Many of us have come from very humble origins. As most Christians over the last 2,000 years were poor and persecuted and impoverished in one way or another. But God had mercy on all of us. And therefore we read in the New Testament, both Jew and Gentile, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ. We're all in the same level. We're all equally accepted by God. Praise God for that. There's no two levels of Christians. The super-Christian Jews who were saved and then the rest of those Gentiles. And that was one of the most liberating wonderful blessings I had when I became a Christian is to realize that we're all one in Christ. And God looks at the heart, not at the outward appearance, not at our upbringing and who we are in our background. And so that's why we say religious bankruptcy. You see, the Pharisees, as you know, did not recognize Jesus as their long-expected Messiah because of God's judgment on the Jewish people. And that judgment is one of the worst judgments that a person, both saved and unsaved, can experience, and it's called spiritual blindness. If the Word of God used to penetrate your heart and change your life and cause you to flee to the throne of grace, 
repenting of sin, asking the Lord to revive you and renew you in your walk and in your faith, but you don't now. That's a dangerous place to be. When the word of God does not penetrate your heart, impact you, and change you. That's the intended purpose of the word of God, is to transform and renew us in the inner man. Every single time, to one degree or another, we read the scripture, we meditate on the scripture. But an unsaved person doesn't have such a legacy or luxury, unless God plants seeds in them through the teaching and preaching and reading of the Word of God that would ultimately lead to their conversion. That's a different story. And so the Word of God can become a savor of life unto life for some and a savor of death unto death forever for others. Brethren, we want the Word of God to be a savor of life unto life for us. We want to maintain a clear conscience in such a way that every time we read the Word of God, there is no area of our inner life and our hearts. There is no area where the Word of God can plumb the depths of our spiritual man and find unconfessed sin. And when that takes place, when the searching sword of God's Word penetrates every aspect of our inner person, our minds, our conscience, our hearts, our logic, our reason, all mental and spiritual faculties, as we read the Word and meditate on it, and that Word goes deeper and deeper and goes to all the most outlying re regions of our inner man, and it finds no unconfessed sin, it only finds light and no darkness inside of us, then the result is going to be the automatic quickening of life in us. And that's why it's important to maintain a clear conscience so that we can prosper and benefit from a life-giving ministry of the Word of God rather than it always being 95% when we use it a means of exposing sin. Yes, that's a function, an important function of the Word of God. But it ought not to be the main and only function of the Word of God. The Word is to be used to cause us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to transform us from faith to faith and from glory to glory. That is from one level of holiness and righteousness and godliness to another. And if you stop reading the word of God, you lose your appetite for it. And you lose, little by little, the ability to have it feed you meat. And you're, you can only handle the milk of the word. And thereby miss out on so much meaning and understanding and application of the meat of the word, which would bring you higher in your maturity as Christians. But because you stop reading the word and it stopped penetrating to the depths, those depths are filled in with sand, so to speak. The word usually takes time to expand back to that wide place where you can handle both milk and meat. You can handle large quantities of the word of God. Like 10 and 20 chapters a day or more. I know what I'm talking about. And just not really have enough time to read more. Because of other obligations. And so the Pharisees had this illiteracy because of God's judgment on them. Turn over to Acts chapter 28. Acts 28, we find there. The Apostle Paul interpreting the spiritual state of the entire nation of Israel very accurately through the discerning ministry of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 25 of Acts 28, So when they did not agree among themselves, 
they departed after Paul had said, mm -hmm. said one word. Paul just finished preaching a sermon to them, and he said one last thing to them when they departed. These are many Jewish pe people. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people having grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. God stopped up their ears. He, he shut down the gateway into the inner recesses of their spiritual being. Their hearts were dull of hearing. Their hearts were hard. When they heard the word, it no longer permeated nor penetrated their hearts. Their spiritual eyes, that is, the eyes of their spiritual understanding, were blinded. They could not understand the meaning of the Word of God except a very physical surface meaning, meaning. And this is what got the Pharisees in trouble because Jesus explained spiritual truths to them by using metaphors and parables on the one hand. And the disciples needed to have Christ explain those as well. But a lot of what Jesus taught, they did understand, the disciples that is. But the Jews did not understand any of it. They were that bankrupt, spiritually speaking, in their understanding, in their intelligence, in their spiritual perception. They couldn't hear the word of God in a way that would provide a response of understanding and growth that would lead to repentance and healing. That is, that, God, that they would turn so that God would heal them. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 for a minute. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted mm -hmm. in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Oh, I pray not only for national Israel, my people, but also for the church, the church that has this constant tendency of a veil of blindness being put over their eyes. We hear the word of God. We're momentarily convicted by the word of God. But because that, that veil is, is such a hard filter that sifts out so much of living, life-renewing truth, it lasts but for a moment because there's so much superficiality that is just beneath the surface, so much stony ground and hard hearts that the word cannot penetrate and go deep to fresh, pliable soil. We need to break up our fallow ground and have God pour floods upon the dry ground of our hearts. We, where are the tears that should be flowing where are the hearts that should be trembling when we hear the word of God? Oh, let us go home as Christians who have been born again by the living word of God and ask God to give us soft hearts again to the word. That every time we hear the word of God, be, before we even leave the worship service, we are repenting where we are at in our seats because the word has such a way with us. And God has given us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And we have maintained a huge spirit of sensitivity to the slightest leading and speaking of the Holy Spirit to our hearts. That it doesn't take but a matter of seconds for our spiritual awakeness to respond to the word right then and there. Mm 
Let us stop walking around in darkness where when we hear the word of God, we're straining to swallow one morsel of nourishment from the word, one crumb we barely get down. And, even, and when that happens even, it only lasts a minute or an hour. Let us get back to that place where, and, and no longer be like those who the word of God did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. What you are doing in your life, whatever it would be, <coughs> that would rob you, whether it be something within you, spiritually, a stronghold of sin, or some defect in your spiritual discernment, or your a schedule is too busy, that is robbing you from the time and the faith that you need to keep our hearts soft and very quick and responsive to the word of God when we read it. When we read it, we need to correct that immediately. And not be like the bankrupt Israelites. Again, John continues to refer to Jesus here and not to himself. He's always redirecting the discussion of conversations to Jesus, away from himself. In other words, in this verse, 26, John is saying, don't think of me as some great man. The one you should be paying attention to is the Lord Jesus. And he says at the end of the verse, yet you don't know it. He says at the end of verse 26, there stands one among you whom you do not know. You don't know him in your hearts. They know about the Messiah. Mm. They're very familiar that a Messiah is to come, but their expectation of the Messiah was to be some military general who would come and not necessarily fight the battle internally to kill sin, the greatest enemy of mankind but to come and fight the Romans. The general Messiah would come and fight the Romans and destroy the Jews' physical enemies on earth. How did their lack of understanding the messianic mission, their understanding of the purpose of the Messiah change in just a few hundred years from the last several minor prophets, the Old Testament prophets, Hosea, Malachi, Amos, Daniel. How did it change from five, six, seven hundred BC to the time of Christ, just several hundred years? They lost their understanding of the heart of their doctrine. The heart of their doctrine. Messianic theology. They did not understand it. A couple of years ago when I was at the VA hospital in Palo Alto, um, I was being discharged from the hospital and uh, the Jewish chaplain came to my bedside because all the names on his list that looked Jewish, even though it's in my, my records, Christian. But anyone who has a last name that looks Jewish, he will visit them. So the chaplain comes in, I'm waiting to be discharged. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you were there at that time, Sherry. You were there, she was there at the time. So uh, he comes in with his Jewish uh, mannerisms. And uh, so he says, oh, you know, and he starts asking me questions. He says, can I pray for you and all the rest? And he, and he said, uh, I said, I'm not Jewish. I was Jewish. I was brought up a Jew in Brooklyn, but I'm not anymore. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor. What? He was very shocked. He asked me a question. Well, how did that happen? So I took five minutes while I was waiting. And I shared my testimony and the gospel woven into my testimony with him. And I said, uh, Chaplain, I said, I'd like to talk with you more about this. Maybe I'll give you a call next week and we'll have, get together for coffee. Is that okay? Sure, I'd love to. He gave me his card, so I called him. I drove back over to the hospital there at the VA hospital, and we went to the cafeteria and had coffee. We spent two hours together. And I asked him a question. I said, what is your branch of Judaism that you identify with? He says, oh, I'm a Reformed Jew. Immediately I knew where he was, doctrinally. 
as a Reformed Jew. His doctrine, his belief, stems back to the Pharisees. I mean the Sadducees, who did not believe in a resurrection. So this rabbi uh, was among the Reformed branch of Judaism, the most liberal, and they didn't believe in an afterlife. The Pharisees were the conservatives. They did. And so, uh, so I asked him, I said, uh, where did you go to seminary? He says, oh, I went to such and such uh, Jewish seminary down in Los Angeles. And um, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, in all of the classes in seminary that you had, were there any classes about the Messiah? Were there any classes about Messianic theology where they taught you the mission of the Messiah and what to expect as a Jew in the coming of the Messiah? He said, no. I was shocked. I said, well, how long did you go to seminary? He said, three years. It's a graduate school on a graduate level. He got his master's degree in from, from the seminary. I said, in three years, you, uh, out of all the doctrine classes and theology classes you took about Jewish theology, there was, there was no classes on the Messiah? Nope. There was no reference to the Messiah? Did, you, did the word Messiah come up? Nope. <laughs> Now, how is it that the very heart and soul of the Jewish religion, the coming of the Messiah, and the deliverance of the Jewish people from their enemies, never get brought up one time, not even mention the name Messiah? Same, the same reason why here. Mm -hmm. The spiritual bankruptcy and blindness of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And in John the Baptist's day, as well as 2,000 years later, in our day, the veil is over their eyes, the blindness in Moses. But it is taken away in Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why we need to keep praying for, for all people, but including unsaved Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Because in your case and in mine, we're on equal footing. Mm -hmm. The veil is taken away in Christ. Secondly, divine... Preeminence, verse 27a. Look at it. Divine preeminence. Let's look at the exposition. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me. This is John's testimony. He stands up and he talks about another person again. He's redirecting the conversation back to Christ. And he talks about this other person that the people had no clue who he's talking about that is preferred before him. Now the people held John the Baptist in very high regard. He was unlike the Pharisees. John the Baptist was bold. He didn't hesitate to call sin, sin. And he called people back to God, back to a living relationship with God himself. And the context gives us two reasons why Jesus was indeed preferred before John. First of all, Jesus came after John the Baptist, we know that, but he is worthy of the people's full attention. Look, it says, he who is coming after me is preferred before me. So John sparks interest in this person who is greater than John himself, this amazing prophet that everyone respected. You mean, John, there's somebody else that's greater than you, that's coming, that we should look to? And he is saying, yes. He's saying, this guy is so great. He's so preeminent. He's so glorious that he's preferred before me. And we find a few t uh, times in the context. The second reason is that Jesus deserves all the praise and preeminence because of his preexistence. That's the second reason why he's preferred before John the Baptist, because he existed before John, John the Baptist because he's eternal God. And the few times in the context I refer to concerning the references is look back, you go turn back to John 1, please. Turn back to John 1. And in verse 15, John 1, 15, John bore witness 
of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, Jesus was born months, several months after John the Baptist was born. So how did Jesus exist before John the Baptist was born if John was born first? He's eternal God. He created John the Baptist and all of us. He was before me. And then in verse 30, so we looked at John 1.15 already and a couple of sermons ago on the Gospel of John. Look at chapter 1 and verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Again, a reference to Christ's preexistence. And then turn over to Mark chapter 1. Mark 1. Mark 1, beginning at verse 6. Mark 1, 6. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Again, the phrase, there's one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to unloose. Let me give you a third reason why Christ's testimony is greater than John's. I already alluded to it. Because he's God. He's the creator and the savior. And John is man. As great as he was, he was just a man. We see a couple of weaknesses in John the Baptist, do we not? Not many. Not many, but a couple of weaknesses. Remember, when he, after he was put in jail by Herod, before he was beheaded, he doubted who Jesus was, his cousin Jesus. After all he had heard about concerning Jesus, after Christ's baptism, John the Baptist heard the, the Father from heaven say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Can you imagine how John the Baptist was amazed at hearing that voice? If Christ was a false prophet, John would have called him out on that. And then he doubts. But he's just a man. He was a man that had great grace from God to be able to do what God called him to do and accomplish what he accomplished. He had to have a driving spirit of holiness that rarely deviated from the narrow way which leads to life. He is God himself and the fact that he, he humbled himself and he condescended from heaven and emptied himself of his glory temporarily and took upon himself human flesh who was born of a woman. It doesn't mean that he, he lost his glory and all that greatness that is attached to himself as the creator, redeemer. We read in Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? In Colossians 1.18 it says, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Oh, there were a few years when Jesus was on earth during his earthly ministry during his humiliation and his humanity. He lived in obscurity. Can you imagine how all of heaven and the angels therein were restrained from bursting forth and proclaiming his glory and his preeminence? The rocks would have cried out had God animated those rocks to proclaim his glory. And so just because for a few years on earth he was restrained and confined to his human body willingly and voluntarily to accomplish the Father's great mission and plan to save his people from their sins does not mean 
that though his glory was hidden and shrouded temporarily for a few years, that he was not worthy of all that glory. And John the Baptist had this dominating, driving thing about his ministry that whenever he would be asked questions or the Pharisees would come and interview him, and in special times, he would point people to Christ, he would talk about Christ, because he knew Christ. He knew of the glory of Christ. And the fear of God was heavily upon him. I can imagine John thinking, God forbid that for one second I would rob my Messiah of his glory by putting the spotlight heavily on myself and talking too much about myself. He said to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me to be baptized? Mm. John knew who he was. We read in Isaiah 52 in a messianic chapter. Isaiah 52, before that great chapter, the gospel in the Old Testament, within the borders of Isaiah 53, the chapter before that, which is also messianic in nature. We read in verse 13, Behold my servant, referring to Christ, shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Yeah. Just as many as were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, referring to his suffering on the cross, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations, kings shall shut their mouths at him. For what had not been told them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall consider. Yes, the glory of Christ, the fullness of his glory, will come out for kings to behold. And their mouths will be stopped. And he shall be exalted and extolled very high. He is preeminent. But John would, would later reaffirm Christ's preeminence in chapter 3, verses 27 through 36, which we don't have the time to look. And in the remaining few minutes, let me just quickly touch on point number 3, man's humility. Verse 27b, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Now this is a powerful metaphor. I want you to think about this because it's a huge principle of the Christian faith. And you and I as believers need to be operating along this principle. In the Jewish Talmud, that's the Jewish book of commentaries, not the Christian commentaries, but the commentaries that the Jews and the Jewish leaders use on the Old Testament. It says, quote, every office a servant will do for his master, a scholar should perform for his teacher, except loosing his sandal thong. In other words, in the Jewish Talmud, a disciple should do the work of a slave except one thing, untying the teacher's shoe. That was so low, untying the sandal or shoe of somebody else, that only the lowest slave in the household was called upon to do it. So what is John saying here when he says, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose? Mm -hmm. John is saying that he, the greatest man who ever lived, apart from Christ, of course, is not worthy to be called this man's disciple, to be called Christ's disciple. I'm not worthy to even be his lowest slave. Mm -hmm. That was John the Baptist's mindset and attitude about Christ. How different from many in the church today who feel that Jesus is their servant. It is an abomination to God what the health, wealth, and prosperity movement is mm. proffering in the form of teaching in the church. It depicts Jesus Christ as the servant. And they teach such, such heresy, this name it and claim it heresy, mm -hmm. that whatever you speak, the words that you use, mm -hmm. 
will bring about reality. My Bible teaches that the Word of God is that which brings into existence anything God wants to bring into existence. God alone can do that. And so, God is not some genie in a bottle forced to give everybody and to grant everyone their whims and their wishes that they claim by faith. That is a lie from hell. But what does the Bible talk about when we see John the Baptist? We see humility in his life. Tremendous humility. Humbled himself greatly. And this truth, this principle of humility carries over in a big way to the church. And this is an area where the church really struggles. Turn over to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, quickly, please. Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, verse 3, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. And then in chapter 23, five chapters to the right of Matthew 18, chapter 23, verse 11. Matthew 23, 11. But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then turn over to John chapter 13. John 13. John chapter 13, verse 2. John 13, 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing... You do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Drop down to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You know, we all struggle in the Christian life. We lose our sense of priorities sometimes. We get caught up with life and things. And when we come to church, we don't have this dominant thought that we're servants mm. in the body of Christ. And we ought to love one another better than ourselves. We should show hospitality. We should give of ourselves to everyone. And this is the example of John the Baptist mm. and his humility. The greatest man who ever lived mm. humbled himself greatly. He ate locusts. He wore camel's hair. He didn't look for notoriety. He was a servant. And we should, we should exalt Jesus over self like this by humbling ourselves. Remember Jesus said in Luke 9, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Every day, my brother and my sister, we need to keep losing our lives. Deny ourselves. Take the lowest place in the church, in our hearts, 
because while we may be the body of Christ, Jesus is the head. And we're told about the importance of humility. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. Romans 12, 1 Peter 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Philippians 2, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We need to push that reset button and get back to the place in our attitude, in our perspective, in our outlook to one another, towards one another, we need to get back to serving one another. Mm. We need to get back to giving to one another. Not just showing hospitality, but wherever the needs are, meet those needs. Mm. We need to talk graciously and kindly to one another. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We need to show love to one another. Love thinks no evil. We need to stop judging one another and have godly thoughts about one mm. another that's driven by love. And whenever love is dominant on our hearts, we want to do something. We not only think loving, mm -hmm. kind, generous thoughts, we think the best about another person rather than the worst. And we're driven by the Spirit to do something. And that something often causes us to tell people we love them. Mm -hmm. There's a holy boldness there to say, brother, sister, I love you. What can I do for you? How can I pray for you? And mean it. We need, to, we need to make sure that we're walking in humility uh, through the example of John the Baptist. And so we see in this passage Christ's glory and John's humility. We see the religious bankruptcy of the Jews and the tendency is we can all fall into that trap. We see Christ's divine preeminence and we see man's humility in the form of John, always pointing people to Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this truth that you have inscribed in your word, a truth for us, a truth for us to digest and to yes. ponder and to apply to our lives, mm -hmm. not just in this moment or an hour from now, but every day. We need humility. We need to glorify Christ as we should and give him the proper place and the proper throne over our hearts and over every area of our lives so that he would increase and we would decrease. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.